next several opportunities that we have. So thanks for joining in. And we'll begin with the New Living Translation and we'll start in chapter one. I'll share it on the screen so you won't have to um, follow along at home. You can just look at the screen if you'd like, but either way, let's uh, begin by looking at Acts chapter one. The promise of the Holy Spirit. And Luke writes, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. We begin here by noting that Luke, as he did with his gospel, references Theophilus, and that he's writing to Theophilus specifically. And you can understand that Luke, from a Greek or a more Gentile perspective, was addressing the questions that Theophilus and others might have that were not that familiar with the Jewish faith. Here he starts to tell of the early church to Theophilus, explaining what happens here during that time. Let's return now to verse 4. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We know of John's baptism, we read of it in the Gospels, but here Jesus reminds his followers, his disciples, that he has a new baptism for them. He told them during his ministry that he would send another comforter when he was leaving them. And here he promises that comforter again, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. So as he comes to meet with his disciples, his followers, prior to his ascension, he reminds them that he is sending the Holy Spirit, that the Father is doing so, and it will happen in just a few days. It happens on Pentecost, and Pentecost occurred exactly 50 days after Passover. So Jesus spent 40 days with them after his resurrection and told them that in just a short time now, he would be sending, and the Father would be sending the Holy Spirit. Let's return to our reading. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus here, referencing something that he told them earlier, that regarding his return, it wasn't to be revealed to them. In fact, no one but the Father knew when Jesus would return. Extremely important to us here now, over 2,000 years later, to remember that. We talked about it last week during a brief end time study that Jesus said he didn't even know. And it was in the Father's hands when he would return. His followers here, anxious for the kingdom to begin, Looking at it from, I think, a perspective that we are not really able to understand in the same way. They were looking for Israel to be restored, for the kingdom of God, for Israel to be what God had said it would be back in their scriptures, the Old Testament. Remember, for that first century church, the scriptures that they had, it was the Old Testament. 
here Jesus said and reminded them again, there would be a return, but the time was not yet. And that only the Father would be the one to know and to determine. Let's return to our reading. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Another reminder here that Jesus is returning. He leaves from the Mount of Olives, and of course we know in the Old Testament scriptures, the promise is that he will return there to the Mount of Olives. Let's move on to verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. Interesting to note that on the Sabbath, that was the limit that they could travel and keep the law. Now verse 13. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Luke here getting very specific to say who's in attendance at this time. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. During this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit, speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery, falling headfirst there. His body split open, spilling out all his intestines. The news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramaic name Akeldama, which means field of blood. Peter continued, This was written in the book of Psalms where it says, Let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, Let someone else take his position. You'll notice throughout the New Testament, that the writers will reference the Old Testament. And as I mentioned, that was their scriptures. Proving a point, saying that things were prophesied, they would always go back to the Old Testament, their book, the Torah. That's what they had for scriptures. Just as we do today to say, this is a proof of God's working, they did the same. And they did it extensively with the Old Testament. So I think it's important for us today as we rely, of course, upon the New Covenant, the New Testament, that we remember it's really talking to us from an Old Testament perspective with the Old Testament promises being fulfilled and certainly being fulfilled in Jesus. Let's return to our reading. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. From the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us, whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they announced and nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias, then they all prayed, O Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen 
as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other eleven. Again, I think it's important to note here that reference to the Old Testament is continually made in the New Testament writings. And here, in the book of Acts, early on, we'll see that the church really revolved around the concept of the Jewish community. So staying with the Twelve, focusing upon the Twelve in Jerusalem, making sure that there were Twelve, just like the Twelve tribes in the Old Testament. And then as the book unfolds, it moves slowly away from Jerusalem and the Jewish people solely. If we were to scroll back into chapter 1, Jesus says that the gospel needs to be taken into these other areas. And it moved into Samaria. It moved into the immediate world around Judea to Galilee. But then it moved into the entire world. As we see the focus later in the book of Acts being the work of Paul as he speaks to the Gentiles. So again, important for us to note that the book is laid out so precisely for us, the book of the Bible, and that in this book of Acts, it's clear how God's working moves into the entire world. Let's return to our reading in chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes as we begin reading here in chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost. Pentecost occurred after the Feast of Weeks. That's that period of time right after Passover that 50-day period of time, taking us to Pentecost when the first harvest really is to take place. So God here showing us that on Pentecost, this great harvest to begin. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. It's important to note here that they were in Jerusalem because of the feast. They either returned home right after Pentecost, I should say right after Passover, and then came back to Jerusalem for Pentecost, or they stayed the 50 days in Jerusalem. So the note here, not surprising, that Luke reminds us that there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem at this time. Verse 6, when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. So the people there, the devout Jews from every nation, had various dialects and languages. And God's pouring out his Holy Spirit and their ability to speak in tongues covered all of these languages. So the people who God had called to hear his message could hear and understand. In verse 7, they were completely amazed, those in attendance. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, 
and the areas of Libya around Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, They're just drunk. That's all. I think important to note here again that as we see, things really do not change. Here, during this miracle, during God's working to reveal to people in their own dialect the wonderful news of the Messiah, the glorious gospel, there were those who scoffed and said, nah, it's not a miracle. There's nothing here special. They're just drunk and they're babbling. You're giving it credit for various languages, for being various languages, but it's just them being drunk. No matter what era, if someone doesn't want to hear the good news, if they don't want to hear the gospel, they'll just poo-poo it. They'll just say, nah, it's not real. None of this is real. None of this is true. Let's see what Peter has to say, beginning with verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. Peter here referencing now the book of Joel in the Old Testament. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Important to note here, upon all people. So, again, the context is the Jewish people were the only ones who had knowledge of the true God. They were the elect, the ones set apart to carry the message. And that's why even as we read here in chapter 2, it would say those who converted to Judaism, because you had to convert to it to get the true message and to understand the real God, the only God, Yahweh, as he was described in the scriptures, in the Torah. But now God says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. It was always God's intention to pour out his spirit on all, for all people to hear of him and the good news. Israel was the chosen vessel, the elect people to bring that message. But his intention was always to show the world the true God and to use the Jewish population, the Jew, to do so. Let's return to our reading. Verse 18. In those days I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Notice here, God says men and women in a time, in a world where women, as we've discussed many times, were so set aside, treated so differently. God does not do so. It was man in his limited ability in his selfish ways to do so, but not God's plan. In the beginning, we read in Genesis, he created them male and female. Verse 19, And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke, just like he did in the wilderness to show that he was with his people. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. 
but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies making them a footstool under your feet. Here Peter, preaching on the day of Pentecost, has this compelling message, telling those in attendance, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, is something that was foretold. It's written throughout the scriptures, throughout the Torah. It's there. It wasn't about David. It was about Jesus. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Peter here is preaching the first great revival message. The first message designed to convict hearts and call people in great numbers to Christ. Let's continue to read here now, moving on to verse 36. So everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Peter's preaching here. The man who denied Christ three times, who was so timid in so many ways and so bold in others, receives the Holy Spirit here on Pentecost and goes out proclaiming powerfully the gospel, telling a crowd that we're the ones who put Jesus on the cross, just as we acknowledge it today. And he doesn't talk about a kingdom the way they were thinking of one at that time regarding the Messiah's coming setting up a physical kingdom. 
evicting Rome, getting Jerusalem back in the hands of Israel. He said, here's what you need to do. Confess your sins. And 3,000 that day came to know that Jesus was the way. I think it's interesting for us, regardless of who we're speaking to, the numbers, the type of person, that God gives us the ability, the power, by his Holy Spirit to do his work. Peter did it here. And 3,000 were added. Let's conclude our reading for today as we move back to verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met today, I should say, met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. It was a beginning here for the early church. Peter with this profound message, 3,000 being added from all of these various places. And from there, after Pentecost, they went back to their homes, to their towns, and spread the good news. You can see how God's plan begins to unfold here in the book of Acts. I appreciate you joining in this afternoon during lunchtime. And I pray that what we've shared and looked at has had uh, value in your life. Thanks again. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to hear from you, to read what you have for us, and to share with each other the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Thanks for joining in.